Caves in Italy are a very typical feature in the landscape. Uh, as you might know, uh, there's the Apennine chain that goes through the whole peninsula, so it's really easy to stumble upon caves. Uh, there are thousands of them, and during uh, the prehistory they were used for many different reasons, but especially during the Bronze Age, uh, uh, most of them were used uh, in a ritual way, strongly ritualized way. So we know more than 150 caves that were used in different ritual, uh, ritual and burial uh, ways. Um, at first, these caves were not recognized as uh, for what they were. Uh, they were mostly looked at as shelter for, uh, shelters for um, shepherds or um, as um, places where uh, material culture could be better looked at because uh, we don't know much about settlement sites. So since caves are quite preservative uh, environments, uh, material culture was taken from there and analyzed to build pottery type uh, chron chronotypologies. Uh, finally, in the early 90s, especially with Ruth Whitehouse's contribution, they were finally recognized uh, for being uh, special places in a way. So now we know that uh, there is not a clear distinction, there shouldn't be a clear distinction between uh, domestic and ritual spaces and sites in archaeology, but we can now all agree on the fact that caves in Italy and in Central Italy, especially during the Bronze Age, were used in a very especially uh, ritualized way. Today, we, uh, well, our research question is whether this ritualization is, uh, can be generalized if rituals are the same in all caves or if there are diversities and what are the reasons for these diversities. So uh, to do that, we are going to look better into three uh, case studies of caves that we have as a team worked for 10 years. Well, some for some 10 years or some a, li a little less than these, but uh, these are very recent uh, studies. And these caves are located in southern Lazio, in central Italy. Uh, the first one is Grotta Mora Cavorso, uh, which is in a mountain environment, forested environment. It's a um, uh, 60 meters long cave, for what we know, and uh, it's, uh, it has a wide entrance, and then it has a sub-horizontal, um, it is a sub-horizontal cave, and um, it was used between the Paleolithic and um, historical times, and especially during the Neolithic times, but also during the Metal Ages. So the Metal Ages uh, occupation is um, only found in the red square area, this one, which is very specific because it's where the light disappears and the darkness appears in the cave, full darkness. So this area is very interesting because we found the remains of one woman adult woman buried in there. It was all disconnected, there was no uh, skeletal connection, but we have over 70% of the skeleton still there. <coughs> and together with these bones, we also found uh, hundreds of um, bones of perinatal domestic animals, so piglets and lambs mostly, and also two pits. Some of, uh, one of them contained an upside down bowl and uh, near this pit there were spindle whores and flint harrow heads. So this really relates to some kind of ritual practice. The most interesting uh, type of ritual performance that uh, characterizes this cave is the one of the sacrifice of these perinatal uh, animals, domestic animals, which is not only typical of this cave, but we can find it uh, 
a similar pattern also in few other caves uh, that you sh uh, that you see on the map. The interesting thing is that we don't ever find uh, we don't find always the same combination of these uh, animals. So we can find human bones and piglet bones, or piglet bones and lamb bones without human bones, or lamb with humans, and so on. So it's not really identical from one cave to another. The second case study. Uh, is Grotta di Pastena, which is also in southern Lazio. It's important to um, stress that these caves are very close to one another. They're 40 kilometers away from one another, more or less, roughly. This is a gigantic cave. It's enormous, several kilometers. And there's a seasonal water stream going through the cave. So this is subject to seasonal floodings. But there's one very, very small cave, this is, that's the one in the red circle, uh, that is very up high in the cave, so it's very hard to climb there, up there. Uh, but it was always, it was never touched by these floodings, and so it was a little treasure for us because the deposit, the archaeological deposit, is very well preserved. In such a small cave, which is 30, 40 meters, uh, square meters wide, we found um, the remains of very interesting structures, several hearths, both on the upper part of this uh, little cave and on the um, floor part of it which looks a bit like a face <laughs> if you look at it. And uh, once again, we find these upside down bowls, three, four of them in just this very little space, small space. And uh, the most inter thing, um, interesting thing of all is the hearts and especially the structures. Well, you see also many fine artifacts we found in here. And those hearts and structures, which are very peculiar, we don't have another example, at least for central Italy, where we found this um, uh, cyclicality in stone pavings that if we remove them, we found layers of burnt seeds, uh, hundred thousands of burnt seeds. And then removing these burnt seeds, we found another stone paving layer and so on and so on for three, four times. So we can see that there is a cyclicality in the occupation. And uh, this is probably the most interesting thing for this cave. Looking at the burnt, uh, well, one thing I was forgetting here, this is also a burial cave, we, but we found very few human bones. We found only four minimum number of individuals. Two of them are children and one is a woman, the other one is unknown. Um, we only found very few bones, mostly uh, fingers and teeth, which might indicate a primary deposition that, that was manipulated and some bones were taken away somewhere else. So this is a completely different burial practice from the one that we saw before. Also in the other cave, we find some kind of cyclicality because it's very unlikely that all those piglets and lamb bones were deposed in one single event. Looking at the, at the burned seeds that we found, we realized that there was 90% of broad beans, of legumes. Uh, and this is also common looking at the few paleobotanic uh, data sets that we have for the other caves in central Italy. Looking at those, we realized that uh, all the burial caves have a high predominance of pulses, of broad beans. Uh, whereas the only caves where these broad beans are not predominant are those that really don't have any other kind of ritual or burial practice in it. And uh, usually the diet of these people was characterized by cereal, cereal diet rather than pulses uh, based diet, which we can also see from the few evidence we have from the settlement. So this is really a specific uh, ritual practice that connects uh, pulses, faba beans, with uh, the burial rituals. And looking at uh, historical sources, mythology, and uh, classical religions, actually we know that this connection exists later on in history. The connection between broad beans and um, um, the souls of the dead 
and it's probably it was probably born much earlier during the Bronze, at least during the Bronze Age. The, the third case studies Grotta di Colle Pardo. This is again a mountain forested environment. The cave is beautiful and it's characterized by this very rich spill fence. And this is very different from both the other case, uh, the cases that we have already examined. So this is the largest cemetery, if we want to call it like that, in central Italy for the Bronze Age. We have over 100 minimum number of individuals buried in it. So it's really, really different from everything, from everything else because usually the average minimum number of individuals that we find in these caves uh, ranges between one and maybe five, six, ten. There's just, just a couple exceptions where they are 40, 40 or 50. Uh, burials, minimum number, uh, number of individuals. Here there are over 100 and it's not over yet. And uh, our bone expert um, detected several types of ritual pra of burial practices in it, going from uh, primary burials to post-mortem manipulation. So some bones were taken and put somewhere else, some specific bones, long bones. Here we can see the distribution of the different parts of uh, the skeleton and this distribution doesn't look to be um, natural. We also found several fine artifacts including amber beads and faience beads and this is really uh, an exception for central Italy and the inner part of central Italy of central Apennines because usually all the other cases are known from more coastal areas. Here we found an enormous number of these fine artifacts like 50 amber beads and as many faience beads and also metalwork which is very rare to find in caves. Another very interesting thing related to this cave is the app apparent spatial differentiation of views. So we have the entrance, uh, illuminated entrance, where there are the only cases of structures of herds and also of animal bones found, uh, indicating some kind of uh, preparatory rituals, <coughs> whereas the darkest part, the innermost part of the cave, is only characterized by human bones and fine artifacts that were probably personal ornaments of the dead. So there might be this kind of uh, differentiation in the, spatial, in the spatial use of the caves. One thing this, that seemed common to all those caves was the pottery, the material culture, and the chronology. So if you have a look at those two uh, tables with um, pottery drawings, they are really are identical, and they are from Gratta Mora Cavorso and from Gratta di Colle Pardo. Uh, up to a few a couple of years ago, really, since we started doing the radiocarbon dating, we all agreed more or less on the fact that these caves were occupied mostly during the Middle Bronze Age phase because of the pottery uh, chronology and because there weren't that many radiocarbon datings. Uh, but these, actually, these dates that we are carrying out in several different sites now tell us a different story. So, for example, for Moraka Vorso Cave, we, uh, we carried out seven, eight dates uh, very recently, and we only had results dating to Copper Age, and we dated both human bones and animal bones. As for uh, Colle Pardo, the big, big cemetery, we dated 15 different individuals and they were all uh, dated to a late phase of Middle Bronze Age. So uh, I'm not here to say that pottery chrono chrono type of chronology doesn't work, even if it's been debated and it's still debated. But the interesting is, uh, thing is that these two data offer us complementary information and we can see that these caves have more complex and longer and differentiated uh, types of ritual practices in them. We thought that they were identical, that they were contemporary, but they aren't. And maybe the fact that pottery is very, very similar to, from one cave to another might mean that in that specific time of the occupation of the cave, pottery was given a mm, stronger emphasis and mm, 
uh, pods were introduced for a specific reason in that specific time, whereas maybe earlier and later, emphasis was given on, on other types of rituals. So it's very interesting. It's a uh, question, big, big question point to, uh, for us to work in the future. So uh, what have we um, learned so far? Uh, going back to our initial research question, are these, all these caves, do they point towards a converging type of ritual or diverging type of ritual? We see that uh, at least some of the dead were often buried in these caves, and we don't have many other examples of burial practices outside caves for this period. We only have rock act tombs, but these, there are, 20 or 30 known <coughs> cases so far. And uh, cyclicality and repetition is one common feature for all these caves and also for the three caves that we have analyzed closer because we, but in different ways. So we have, for example, the repeated deposition of perinatal animals in the first cave. In the second one, we have the cyclical paving and the deposition of burnt crops and so on. And in uh, Collepardo, we have this repeated deposition of dead of the of the dead so it's converging and, di and di diverging in a way another common feature might be seen in this dark light uh, uh, focus emphasis so we see that uh, darkness is where the more most uh, intense rituals were performed and then we see that there are some common um, structural and ritual practices like the upside down pots and the uh, broad beans recurring and also uh, the animal bones that we've seen uh, the perinatal bones all of these point uh, to point towards um, an attention to the <coughs> cycle of life of death and death bo of both humans and of nature and they, these are best uh, represented in caves because they really represent the innermost part of the earth, the motherly part of the earth that can really uh, hold this kind of seasonal rituals. But on the other hand, these are really, it's not possible to generalize because We've seen that many caves are occupied during this period, but not all of them. So, and all of them are very, each cave has its special characteristics. It's not all the same type of caves. So there, are, there is the one that is very big, but there's a very small cave inside. Then there's the one that could even be a shepherd rock shelter because it's so, it's, uh, so horizontal and it's hospitable. And then there's the Collepardo cave, which is so complex in spill of them. The space is, dif is used in different ways. And ritual practices in all of these caves can be both linked and not linked to burial practices. So this is not even a common point. Also within the burial practices, we see that the, there is not just one way to bury the death and to perform burial practices. So primary, secondary, and both of them in different caves. And even when we try to find a common point, a common ground in the rituals involving plants and animals, they are very different from one cave to the other. So some of them relate to, but all of them we can see they related to a ectonic cult, ectonic, some kind of ectonic religion that in classical period can be related to Dim Dimitra uh, rituals and religions. So, uh, in conclusion, I think that variability is the only common denominator of these rituals, so there's no way to generalize them. Of course, we, they all uh, start from a common ground that is this very strong meaning symbolism related to caves that represents this link with the nature, and so it's the best place to represent uh, the cycle of human uh, life and that cycle and nature life and that cycle. But other than that, caves are so different in the way they are used, even if all for ritual and even burial uh, purposes. So in conclusion, uh, the research questions for the future are, are these caves used differently because 
each community was frequenting or few communities were frequenting one specific cave and they were personalizing the rituals or it is is it the other way around so each cave had an agency had a personality in a way and so it influenced the way communities performed in that specific cave probably as usually most of time is it's a combination of those uh, two points of view, but uh, how can we understand more about this? So there are several ways. First of all, we have to perform more radiocarbon dates to see the, the duration and the intensity of frequentation of each site. DNA and isotope analysis can help us understand whether these communities were, were similar, were the same, same size, or how much they were differentiated. And Certainly, we need to carry on more surveys, surface surveys, because we need to know more about settlement sites and so about settlement uh, models and patterns in this area, which is mostly known for the caves. But as we have understood very well, caves are very biased sites. Uh, they can't tell us about the everyday, everyday life of people. And so in order to know better about the religion and the symbolic world of these people, we know we need to know better about their uh, everyday life. Um, so it's a very interesting challenge for the future. Thank you for your attention.